Can you believe it's been four years since the first foldable Galaxy phone was released? This is the Galaxy Z Fold 5 and we can just see how far we've come. But folding phones have remained nothing more than a novelty up until now. So what about the Fold 5? Does it make sense in 2023? And who's it for? Let's take a look. Technology and the gadget space is incredible because it showcases the kind of ingenuity of mankind and the greatness of what we can achieve within the bounds of physics. Mobile phones throughout history have been one of the very few chosen devices that companies will continue to try show innovation. From the razor thin clamshell form factor we saw with Motorola and the Razer, to the popular sliding candy bar phone we saw with the LG Shine, or even Samsung's own D500. These phones have been at the epicenter of innovation. And I mean, just look at how drastically the iPhone changed the world when they released that in 2007. So Samsung then has always been at the table with phones, spearheading the development of weird and wonderful concepts, all in the name of innovation. And they've been willing to throw all sorts of mud at the wall to see what sticks, from the Note Edge to the Galaxy Mega, then of course, the Z Fold in 2019. So naturally, if there's anyone that you'd have faith in that would nail the folding phone and make it relevant, you'd think Samsung would have a pretty great shout. Now, I remember back in 2019 when they first released the Z Fold, I thought it was an amazing innovation in technology, but it needed time to mature thanks to its durability or lack thereof. So has it actually improved? I mean, in some ways, the idea of being able to fold a screen in half still blows my mind, considering what we've become used to over the last 15 to 16 years with normal candy bar slabs we see everywhere. The Z Fold 5 though comes at a time where folding phones are increasingly mainstream with more and more competitors coming into the fore with the likes of the Pixel Fold, the OnePlus Open, the Oppo Find M3 and more. So nowadays it simply isn't good enough to be a participator. You need to stand out and if you don't do anything outrageous that differentiates you from the competition, you at least have to nail the experience. And so with the Fold 5 being the fifth generation in Samsung's lineup, it's now the culmination of Samsung's maturity in this folding space. And you'd expect it to be the most refined version of the folding phone, and it is. So from a design perspective, the Z Fold 5 is a very familiar experience. Externally, it matches the same design language of all the other Galaxy phones. When closed, the phone is still a rectangular glass slab, it's got a nice frosted back, which hide fingerprints really well, but it's quite smooth and quite slippery. You've also got that utilitarian camera module in the corner and it sticks out a lot more than you would expect. On the sides, you've got these flat-ish aluminum rails on the sides, and I'm a real fan of that recessed power button and the fingerprint sensor. It's snappy, accurate, and the slightly recessed design mean it's not as easy to cause accidental touches or unlocks. Unlike with my experience with phones that have the same concept, but with the button sitting flat with the frame, like with ASUS Zenfone 9 or Zenfone 10. Now I also like the feel of these volume rockers. They're a bit of a thin edge design, but they're solid and they click with real confidence. And it feels nice and premium, true to its price really. And of course, looking at it from the side, you can see that it finally closes flat completely without a huge gap in between, which should prove useful to reduce dust and lint collecting inside the screen and hinge, and hopefully improving its durability. Now on the front, you've got that narrow and flat AMOLED display, it's nice thin bezels on the side, and you've got a single hole punch camera on the top. In classic Samsung fashion, the screen gets really bright, it looks great, and has rich, vibrant, and almost oversaturated colors that are really pleasing to the eye. That narrow design though is a little controversial, but I'm actually a fan. It makes using it with one hand really, really easy. And it almost reminds me of when Apple first changed up their design of the iPhone with the iPhone 5, making it slightly taller, but with the same narrow width. And considering the front screen is probably used for at a glance activities like just simply shooting off a quick message reply, ordering an Uber, or snapping a quick photo. The narrower screen makes it really easy ergonomically given the thickness when folding up with its weight. 
Now I'd imagine if you combine that thickness with a screen that is a little bit more of a traditional aspect ratio, it'd be more uncomfortable to use. And so overall, I'm a fan of that narrow screen. Open it up though, and you've got the PS de Resistance, which is what you've bought that phone for. You've got that massive 7.6 inch tablet sized folding AMOLED screen on the inside. And if you've never used one of these phones before, you'd be forgiven for just stopping and staring at it for a solid minute or two. It's super bright, vibrant, and it really encompasses the entire footprint of the phone. You've got even bezels across the whole device, and if I'm being honest, I didn't even realize there was an internal selfie camera for a few days until I accidentally came across it when I was messing around with the camera. When you do see it, it's pretty noticeable thanks to that massive resolution drop. But honestly, with day-to-day -day use, I can't say I've ever been bothered by that hidden selfie camera. You can definitely see the super low resolution patch up the top, but it sits in such an inconspicuous part of the screen, it just kind of disappears into the corner and you never see it. That being said though, Given the really bad quality photos you get from it, and the fact that you've got a real selfie camera on the front, I'm not really sure the selfie camera on the inside is actually needed. I've used it a total of once since getting the phone, and that was simply to test the quality of, well, lack of quality of images, and that's it. Folding phones mean you can simply use the main camera system to take selfie photos, making the internal one pretty much redundant. And so in the interest of cost and space saving, I think Samsung should really just drop the internal selfie camera completely for the next generation and not need to mess about with the screen to hide a camera. That way the screen is unblemished and there'll be one less thing for people to complain about. Now, speaking of complaints, I do have some concerns about the screen's durability because ultimately you can just clearly feel and see how soft the surface is. It feels like somewhere between a plastic screen protector and a thin layer of glass, which isn't surprising given it has to constantly bend. Now I've been using the S Pen with it when editing photos, and with that, I don't actually have the highest level of confidence in using it properly with the natural amount of pressure I normally use when I write or draw. It does feel like using a normal amount of pressure could permanently mark the screen, which isn't great, and you certainly don't want to use your fingernail to clean particles off it because that'll almost certainly leave a mark. But what also leaves a mark is that crease. It is there and unfortunately it's unmistakable. Now admittedly, the crease sitting vertically does mean you don't really notice it when swiping around. And when looking at the screen front on and focusing on the content, you do forget that there's a crease in the first place. And the main time I've really noticed it show up is when rotating the screen 90 degrees so videos fill up the screen more to reduce the black bars. And even in those cases, once I was focused on the content, I didn't really notice it. And so speaking of using the screen, it's been really great. It's a quad HD resolution screen with a four by three aspect ratio, which makes it great from a handling perspective and has a really balanced feel in the hand. Now it's still a classic super AMOLED display that goes all the way up to 120 Hertz. So it's super smooth and bright. Colors are brilliant and photos or videos really pop on the screen. It's perfect for watching videos and that extra screen real estate makes it really nice to do a spot of multitasking. Samsung's done a great job optimizing the multitasking experience with One UI and you can easily have four separate apps open. Now, I mean, I'm not sure how many people would be doing this on the regular, but for me, it's been nice to be able to browse the web, have a YouTube open in the corner and also have something like Twitter or X or Instagram sitting on the side as well. Now, I brought the Fold with me on an overseas holiday recently, and I didn't bring my laptop simply just to reduce how much weight I needed to carry. So I set myself the challenge to only use the Z Fold 5 for things like photo editing and content consumption, and honestly, it smashed it out of the park. Lightroom paired with the Z Fold is a match made in heaven and was fully featured outside of needing to do further editing on Photoshop itself. And so that bigger screen made editing photos a breeze and paired with the Fold Edition S Pen, so the pen itself actually doesn't need to be attached to the device or via a cable. Instead, it lives on the rear of the Samsung S Pen case, which is much sleeker than the older version and has a nice and satisfying mechanism to click in and out of place. Now, the only complaint I have with that was because it actually relies on a certain proximity to the screen in order to work. So the S Pen seemed to lose sensitivity or power when using it in the periphery of the screen at certain angles. But outside of that, it was really nice to use a stylus simply to brush edits for masking purposes or just use it to make more precise adjustments. And so the S Pen is perfect for a phone like the Z Fold where you probably wanna get more stuff done. 
It's certainly not an essential accessory to have, but it does add a certain level of quality of life. Now, of course, the smooth experience is also thanks to the internal chip, the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, instead of Samsung's own Exynos chip. Here, the Snapdragon handled photo editing and exporting like a champ, and this extended to all other aspects of using the phone. One being gaming, which is another huge beneficiary for that bigger screen and Snapdragon chip. And to cool it all, Samsung's bundled in a much larger vapor chamber, so games do run perfectly without any major stutters or hiccups. Plus, they look absolutely brilliant on that large display, far more immersive than playing on a traditional phone. And then combine this with the fact that you've got two massive stereo speakers on the side, and you've got a content consumer's dream. I mean, I loved using this during our time on holidays, and now even when I've got a spare second or two to hash out a quick round of Ocean Horn, Carex Drift, or Genshin Impact, it's been an absolute beast. For me, this is also one massive pro for the Fold because if you do a ton of mobile gaming, this huge screen makes a massive difference. Now, all of this power needs juice, so you'd expect a big phone to have a big battery, right? Well, no. The Z Fold 5 actually has one of the smaller sizes in terms of foldable phones with a 4400 milliamp hour battery, which is even smaller than the Pixel Fold, which has a 4800 one. But what it loses out in sheer size it wins on efficiency because combined with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, it lasts way longer than you would expect a phone with such a huge screen to. Sure, it's not quite as long as an S23 Ultra, but it actually held up really well, pushing somewhere in the region of five to six hours of screen on time, even with gaming, photo editing, watching TV shows, movies, YouTube, whatever, all throughout the day. Because I think the combination of using that smaller screen for general tasks on the front with only using that bigger display for content consumption has worked really well to optimize battery life around normal daily use. And then charging the battery is a breeze too because it uses USB-C, of course. And of course, it doesn't come with a charging brick either. But if you've got your own fast charger, it'll charge at up to 25 watts, which again isn't the fastest around for 2023, but it can get from zero to 100 in about 80 minutes. And of course, you can still let it chill on a wireless charger as well at 15 watts, and that'll take about two hours to charge. In normal situations, the phone lasted more than long enough to last all day and get you to the end of a working day to charge it for the next. But all in all, battery life and charging is pretty standard, and so there's not a whole lot to complain about in my opinion. And honestly, that actually applies to the cameras too, which is surprising given the fact that we know that the main attraction with the Z Fold 5 is actually the folding screen. So it's not overly surprising to see that the camera system is about the same as last year's Z Fold 4. It's got older hardware, but it at least still has three cameras. You've got that 50 megapixel main shooter with an f1.8 lens, a 10 megapixel three times telephoto zoom with a 2.4 aperture lens, and a 12 megapixel ultra wide with an f2.2 lens. So it covers all the important focal lengths and what else can I say about the photos it makes other than that, well, they're pretty decent. Honestly, any smartphone worth its salt in 2023 is going to make decent photos. And if it's daylight, up to maybe 95 to maybe even 99% of new phones nowadays, whether they're mid-range or flagship, they're gonna make good photos. It's in the lower light situations where it'll be tested the most. And honestly, given how good computational photography has become with night mode, even more average system will make decent photos. And the Z Fold 5, on balance, has a very reliable camera system. Photos taken across all three of these lenses in daylight or good lighting are really good, even down to the three times zoom. They all pop with the classic Samsung color science with a healthy dose of sharpening, which may or may not be to everyone's taste. And for most people though, I think it's gonna be very, very good. And only really the most OCD of users are gonna find faults here and there. Now in lower light, you'll definitely see the shorter comings of the older hardware. The telephoto lens still shoots okay photos, if I'm being honest, but you can tell the phone is doing quite a lot of heavy lifting to make it look presentable. The ultra wide is definitely on the softer side when you're not using night mode, but in a pinch for casual snaps, They'll do a job, but they're not going to be printed and hung up on a wall anytime soon. Or maybe you will, you do you. The main lens, however, is not bad to be honest. That f1.8 lens does a really decent job gathering as much light as possible, so most of these shots still turn out pretty decent. Now they're definitely not matching something like a Pixel 8 Pro, but on the whole, I think most people are gonna be more than happy with it. Plus that folding form factor means the camera system is a little more versatile too. I loved being able to use the camera in a slightly 
bolded form so I could take rather wide and dramatic lower shots when I was on holidays. I loved being able to place the phone folded and pointed slightly upwards on the ground for a really low shot that captured things like the Patronus Towers and KL in all its glory with a nice reflection of the fountain in front of it. I didn't need a tripod, I could just plonk it down and shoot. Samsung's clearly thought about this too since you can actually choose where you want the viewfinder to be sitting in order to get that perfect shot. And this extends to the selfie shots too because you can actually use that front narrow screen to be your viewfinder. So you can actually take the highest quality selfies on any phone to date. I loved having this feature when hanging out with friends. And I don't know about you, but this makes me way more likely to actually print some of these selfie photos and showcase it seeing as how, how good the quality is. I rarely even use the main front selfie camera purely because I had access to way sharper photos with the main lens. But in a pinch, if you needed to very quickly take a photo or video, that front selfie camera is also perfectly fine. Now, I also love the fact that it's still an autofocusing lens. So that actually beats out a ton of smartphones purely just with that feature. But other than that, there's not much else to say about it. It's there, it's fine, it does a decent job. Now, videos is also a similar affair. It can shoot all the way up to 8K 30 frames per second in pro mode, but that'll result in a huge crop with not great stabilization. So have a think about that. But when shooting all the way up to 4K though, it's pretty good. It's not gonna win any awards, but in the scheme of just social media posting or just capturing your own personal memories with video, the Fold 5 is pretty good. And especially with the main lens, it's a really reliable shooter. Stabilization works well, autofocus is quick and accurate, and the ultra wide and telephoto cameras, they do leave something to be desired when it comes to quality, and you'll want to ensure that there's a good chunk of light in order to get half decent results. Otherwise, the ultra wide and the telephoto can be a little bit of a soft blurry mess in terrible lighting. So long story short, the cameras on the Z Fold 5, they're pretty decent. For the majority of users, I'd even hazard to say the cameras are pretty great. But don't expect flagship quality or you're gonna be disappointed. But will you be disappointed with the Z Fold 5? Well, it's more of a complicated question nowadays because of how much competition there is. Samsung aren't the only players in this space anymore. And nowadays you've got other companies like Oppo or OnePlus breathing down Samsung's neck with arguably even better hardware than Samsung. So considering the Z Fold 5 starts, yes, starts at $2,599 in Australia for the 256 gig version, even in 2023, that is a huge chunk of money to get into the foldable space. Especially considering the cost of living crisis happening at the moment, you really need to take a second minute to have a think about that. But what you get for that hard earned cash is honestly the most mature and refined version of a Samsung foldable yet. The hardware is just simply beautiful and solid and you get reliable guaranteed software and security updates from Samsung for many years. You get a clean and well thought out software experience with One UI and overall, the Z Fold 5 is a really solid package. Now, do I think it's worth it at that price? Probably not, but you gotta understand that this phone and of course, all large folding phones target a niche market at the moment. I think it's a great device though, and I think it's got really damn cool technology inside, and I love having that huge screen. I'm just not sure there are that many other people that do though, for this price. So if you can find the Z Fold 5 for less than $2,000 or even closer to $1,500, then I think it'll be a no-brainer. But until the Z Fold or a similar product hits that sort of price range, I still think it'll be a product for more enthusiasts. But everyone else, well, You've still got normal phones like these guys. Anyway, what do you guys think? Have you crossed over to the light and converted to a folding phone? And do you think the Z Fold 5 is worth it? Let me know why or why not in the comments section below. Thanks so much for watching the video guys. As always, if you enjoyed what you saw, give us a like, subscribe for more, and of course, ding the bell icon so you don't miss out. Thanks again for watching the video. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.